Hello YouTube! I am Lightly Salted, I will be your host for today, and today we're going to be taking a look at my absolute favorite game currently. This is U-Boat. This is an early access game on Steam. I, uh, While it's early access, I recommend picking it up now. It, they are continuing to make improvements as they go. This is currently build 126 Hotfix 3. Uh, 127 is available to play as an alpha, but we're going to be sticking with the most stable version. And we're going to start off at the normal difficulty with U96. So let's jump in and take a look at what we can see. Okay, and the first thing that happens is it wants us to select um, a few things. We start off at the top here with units. Uh, you've got mixed nautical, or sorry, that's kilometers and knots, so distance and speed. You can pick metric, you can pick mixed or nautical, so that's strictly nautical knots and nautical miles. I prefer mixed as the default, I like it better. Save mode, you've got normal and ports only, so this will allow you to, in normal mode, save whenever you wish, or you can save only when you get back to the port to give yourself that little bit of extra realism. We're just going to stick with normal for now. Gameplay mode, we've got normal and we've got first person only. So it's important to note that you do not have to select first person only to play in first person. Uh, if you stay on normal mode, you could play the majority of your game in first person mode, if not the entirety of your game in first person mode, for that added experience of living on a 1940s U-boat. Or you can stick with normal and swap in and out as you go. I'm going to be sticking with normal and that is also the play style I tend to stick with. Audio language, you've got German and English currently. We're going to stick with German. I find that the English, um, it sort of takes you out of the experience of the game, uh, first and foremost. And secondly, the voice acting is a little cartoony on English. Uh, you hear the captain say things like, faster, faster. And it's just, it doesn't have the same ring as schneller, schneller. So we're going to stick with German. Darker Nights. So Darker Nights, if you wanted to select that, that's going to make sight almost impossible. Outside of your sub, you won't be able to make out three feet in front of your face most uh, nights unless you got a really good moon. We're going to be sticking with uh, not enabling darker nights for now. Realistic bilge. So realistic bilge, what that does is uh, when you open up your um, conning tower to get to the outside or the inside of your sub during, say, rain, storms, so on and so forth, water is going to pour into your submarine and you have to remember to close the hatches behind you. Uh, that's a little advanced, I think, and uh, in all honesty, while I like a lot of the realism of this game, I still enjoy the fact that it's a game, um, so I don't tend to use realistic bilge. I do, however, use realistic earth curvature, uh, because I don't like the idea of the ocean being 100% dead flat and me being able to see for just about eternity. I want, to, uh, I, I want the experience of watching an enemy ship come up over the horizon, so we're going to be leaving realistic earth curvature on manual item delivery so if you use this option you'll have to manually equip an engineer with a spare part and a medic with the first aid kit so that means if your engineer is going to be doing any repairs to your sub you will have to physically have them pick up the spare part and carry it with them conversely your medic who nine times out of ten is going to be your radio officer he would have to have a first aid kit in his backpack ready to go if anybody got hurt or they were uh, sick, you tend to get, you can get just uh, randomly sick in this game. Um, officer or crew could come down with tuberculosis even, and uh, it's up to your medic to take care of that. Uh, we're going to leave that checked off. At the same time, I will be showing you guys how to um, put things in your uh, into every officer's personal inventory. Um, I tend to play that way just to save up room in my storeroom. Collision damage. It says experimental. It works pretty well. Re uh, I'm not going to lie. If you crash into anything, uh, another ship, bang into the dock, hit the bottom of the uh, hit the bottom of the ocean, let's say in in very shallow water, you will take damage to your submarine. You may just straight up sink. We're gonna leave that off for now, just for the purposes of the tutorial. But it adds something to the game. It really uh, makes you more aware of your surroundings. Uh, gives you a little more control over steering, or, or rather, forces you to have a little more control over steering and. Uh, it's generally a good time. I, I, I'd suggest it. Hardcore aiming mode. So, when you are coming across enemy targets, be they ships, battleships, the game, uh, provided you have someone sitting at the hydrophone or somebody sitting at the periscope or so on and so forth, will begin calculating a torpedo solution for you. 
I would suggest not using hardcore aiming mode until you've played around with the game a little bit and gotten a feel for how the targeting solutions work in U-Boat. The high detection hint. So as we'll see in the game on the lower right side of your screen, you will have a little icon that's going to give you information about how visible your boat is, how noisy your boat is, so on and so forth. And it will light up bright yellow with an exclamation point in it when you have been detected. But if you hide this, you don't know how detectable you are and you don't know when you are detected. So again, that's something I recommend after you've played with the game a little bit. So we're going to leave that off. So let's just jump in and see the game. So the first screen you get is customizing the skipper. So you can change his voice, his shirt, pants, binoculars, sorry, accessory one and two. You can give him pipes and an eye patch if you want. You can change his hat, his hair, beard, basics, like Fallout style. You just give him new clothes and a new outlook on life. And uh, yeah, and you can do that with every single one of your officers, by the way. It just lets you customize the skipper from the get go, because realistically, he's the most important guy at the moment. So let's just click next. His name is by default Close Graph, and we're going to leave it as such for the purposes of the tutorial. You can name him Captain Diaper Genie. It wouldn't matter. But uh, yeah, let's get in. You will get tips on the screen. So uh, here we've got uh, at large depths, there's a so-called shadow zone due to the acoustic layer above it. Enemy vessels will find it much harder to detect our ship using the hydrophone or sonar. So the deeper you are, the harder it is for them to find you, basically in a nutshell. Some of these tips are pretty useful. Some are really basic, like don't turn on your lights at night because other ships can find you. Okay, and here we can see the sub, and there's Klaus Graf, our captain. He's walking by. He's heading up the conning tower. We can see that a sailor had just put away the observation telescope. We've got some meat hanging here by the side. Um, <laughs> when it comes to submarine storage, even in today's world, wherever it fits is where it's going to go. Okay, before we touch anything, before we really start digging into this sub, let's talk about what we can see. Okay, let's talk about um, the mechanics of the game so far. So let's start at the uh, top left corner, and you can see that I can just pan around with the mouse, or I can use WASD to move around. But uh, up here we've got a camera mode. We've got first person, we've got section view, which is what we're in right now, and you've got orbit view. So you can select here, or you can just use your mouse wheel, okay? I don't have anybody selected. I have no officers selected here in the bottom, and you see the selection process down there. So I can't get into first person mode because I have no one selected. But I can get into orbit mode by pulling back on the mouse wheel. Instead of using the command up here, I can just pull back on the mouse wheel and boom. And what a fantastic graphic for showing you um, the breakaway or the, the cutaway of the submarine. It's just fantastic. I love it. Okay, so talking about the first person mode, I could select Mr. Graph and I can push in with the mouse wheel. Just keep pushing in and boom. Now this doesn't look like first person and, and you'd be right, okay? But this is getting as close as I can get without actually going into first person mode. So if I click leave position... To take him off of the UZO, you can see he's working here, off of the UZO. I could click leave position, and now I'm in complete first person mode of Mr. Graph using basic mouse and WASD. So we're just going to pull back again. Uh, you know what, actually, while I'm doing this, I'll have him show you the targeting site since we're up here, right? So this is the targeting site. This is the UZO. This is how your captain or any leader, leader type officer, uh, any leader can use any observation post, so be that the observation scope, the attack scope, or the UZO. We'll get up to the UZO, and we'll go manual mode right here, and boom, we are using the UZO telescope, periscope. Bi -scope? I don't know what the name is. We're going to go with sight. Yes, okay, the sight. So let's talk about the sight. Um, You've got your basic WASD movement. You could grab the screen, drag it around. Hey, look at that. We've uh, identified that that is an AA gun. So the attack periscope and the UZO would both identify enemy armaments. So if you're coming across another ship, an enemy ship, and it's got guns aboard, just passing the crosshairs of your either your UZO or your attack periscope will light it up for you and let you know what's going on. So we can uh, right-click, zoom in more. And, ooh, this, this gun is taking a beating, it looks like. It's only got one health bar out of three. We have 1x and 8x, okay? So you jump on this, and for whatever reason, your captain was staring off into space, and you just really need to see what's in front of the boat right now. You can hit this button here, top center of the screen, and bam, it takes you around to uh, zero degrees on your ship, okay? Not zero degrees on the map, zero degrees as per your boat, okay? We could also change the color. So if it's a really bright day, we could make it shaded to give us some better sight or if it's a darker day lots of clouds 
we could go and make it yellow and make it a little bit easier to see um, your targets. So we're just going to leave it at normal. You've also got access to your identification book. So this is for identifying enemy ships. Uh, you've got access to your statimeter tool. This is for gaining knowledge about the distance of the enemy ship. Your, current, your chronometer. This is to figure out how fast that ship is going. Uh, then you would have your uh, course tool to figure out the course of the ship you're about to attack. And then, of course, your torpedo bay. And this is going to give you information not only of that this torp has been warmed up. You see it's red. This torp is being loaded because it says loading. It's pretty handy like that. And these tubes are empty. So you've got one, two, three, four tubes forward. And tube five is at the aft rear of your boat. And we'll get into all this stuff once we get off the docks and uh, we talk about it a little bit. Um, so let's get back into orbit view, start where we started. What else can we see here? So we can see that we are in La Rochelle in the northeast Atlantic. It is now the 11th of January, 1941. It is 10 o'clock in the morning. Okay. To the right of that, and this will update no matter where you are. This will tell you, give you a rough, rough approximation of where you're at. Uh, so it won't, be, uh, it won't be absolutely every bit of information you need, but it's, it'll be helpful in a pinch. So we've got a pause button. Everything right now is in ultra super slow-mo, okay? So it's very important to note that there is no pause for this game. There is slow it down a lot, but no pause. So don't pause it in the middle of a battle and go off to fix yourself a sandwich because when you come back, you're probably going to be dead. So again, not a pause, but it'll give you a minute to take a breath and figure out what's going on. So say you just got attacked by an enemy warship or depth charged, and you need to take stock of what's leaking, what's broken, who's alive, who's dead, who needs medical assistance, so on and so forth. You can slam the uh, pause button either here or just use your spacebar key and take a breath and figure out what it is you want to do. Okay, so by hitting spacebar, we'll go back into normal time. And here we are again in normal time. So we've also got times one speed. We've also got times five speed. What? So in order to get back to normal time, you either just hit the button again for the fast travel or you can hit space to pause it, space again to get back to the game. Let's talk about further to the right at the top of the screen. So we've got some icons here. And the first one is your battery capacity. This is your accumulators. This is the batteries of your boat. The accumulators themselves are in here somewhere. I think right here. Yes, these are the accumulators somewhere in here. This is your electric engine right here. And your accumulator, uh, your battery, sorry, uh, hold the charge for your electric engines and all of your um, ancillary equipment. Things like your ventilation, your gyroscope, your uh, radio, so on and so forth, okay? Right now, you can see that our battery capacity is 83% and it is falling. And that's because our gyro compass is on. It's taking away two electrics per minute. So if I was to turn the gyro compass off, this should be at an absolute neutral value and we wouldn't be losing power. And you can just click this little button right here to turn the lights off. By the way, it kills all power to this section. So any machines in this section would stop working if I did that. But it, that example is fine. But if you say take the forward torpedo room, if I turn off the lights here, we are still losing two um, charge electric bolt lightning per minute. Okay. So turning your lights off is not going to save you in that uh, idea of keeping the lights on longer. Um, to the right of that, we've got your fuel. This is your diesel fuel. So your diesel engines are all the way back here, right there. And as you use your diesel engines, you're, of course, going to burn through your diesel. Right now, we're at 91%, and we're not consuming any. It's very important to note that when you're underwater or just running on electric engines for the hell of it, maybe to conserve fuel, this green bar will go down and down and down. It will turn yellow, it'll turn red, and then you'll be out of juice, okay? Once you're out of power or getting... Don't ever run out of power, please. <laughs> Once you get low on power, you have to fire up your diesel engines, which means you have to either be at the surface... Or you have to have a snorkel equipped to your boat, and that won't be unlocked until doing some research later on. So you can use your diesel to recharge your batteries, but you can cruise for a fair distance on your batteries only. But without diesel, you're uh, unless you're real close to home, you're pretty hooped. Okay. To the right of that, we've got your oxygen. Of course, we're sitting at 100% oxygen. The crew is currently using four oxygen per minute. But since we're surfaced and we've got our hatches open uh we're getting 600 uh sorry plus 600 fresh air per minute so we're never going to be in danger of running out of air so once you submerge and you no longer have access to outside air obviously because you're underwater this is going to start decreasing it's going to decrease pretty quickly um because that uh, minus four from the crew it's not a ton but 
it's going to add up over time, and you don't want to be underwater for more than a few hours if you don't have to be. Um, speaking to oxygen, you can actually slow down the rate at which oxygen is burned on your ship. So let's say we submerge the boat. If we get Mr. Hag Hagenau, Hagenau over here, to head over here, you can see these little gear lights up. You see these little gears? These are things that your officers can interact with. And we'll get into that. But you can see here that he could turn this light to a different color. So if you just were to um, left-click it, he would just switch it to red. Because you can see that the little red icon is lit up. But if you right-click it, it gives you more options. Everything has the ability to right-click. It'll just give you some more options. So white lighting, it's daytime. We have the white lights on. Perfect. Great. Blue lighting... So when you're underwater and you turn on the blue light, anybody that is not required, right? So ancillary crew members that we don't have access to, stuff like that, they are going to go to bed and they are going to be as quiet as they possibly can because you're underwater, you're under attack, so on and so forth. The blue light will slow down your oxygen consumption, okay? So that's going to make uh, the oxygen you take down with you last you a little bit longer. So if you're ever going to be underwater and running a longer attack on a convoy or a ship or so on and so forth, you definitely want this blue light on. It's very, very important to remember it. Um, you've also got the option of the red lighting, and what that does is it will turn all the lights in your boat onto red lighting only, okay? But not only um, will it turn to red lighting, but if it was nighttime and your crew is trying to sleep, having the white lights on is actually a detriment, and we'll get into discipline in a moment, but it's going to make everybody cranky because they can't sleep with all the lights on. But it also has the added bonus that outside your ship, the um, game engine will actually brighten your screen outside your ship, okay? So that's going to give you better sight at night. Obviously, red light for night vision. If you have red light on, you can see better at night. Very, very important when you're making attack runs at night or uh, sneaking into a port at night, so on and so forth. So you definitely want to remember these lights. Um, to the right of that, we've got our discipline. Discipline is currently at 100%, so everybody's quite happy. And you can see here we've got some multipliers. So for varied dishes, that being food aboard, and not only just aboard, but in the galley, so being prepared by our chef, um, that is giving us a plus four per minute on our discipline. We also have normal lighting engaged because it's daytime. It's giving us a plus 10%. Now, if this was nighttime, that would actually be a minus 10%. They'd be, they'd be cranky at us for having the normal lighting on. Discipline... Um, is affected by an awful lot of things. It's affected by the depth uh, at which you're submerged. It's affected by being at alarm. It's affected by uh, weariness, how long you've been at sea. So fatigue plays a big part. So if you go for, oh, I don't know, a week and a half, two weeks long mission, uh, your crew is going to be fatigued. They're going to be cranky. They're going to be exhausted. So your discipline will deplete faster. Now, there's some things you can do to keep your discipline up, and that would be to have more kinds of food in your galley, right? So if you look here in the galley, we've got fish and we've got potatoes. So since there are two food types, we get a plus, um, a plus four multiplier. If we look here in the storeroom, I just right click there, look in the storeroom. If I pull up the galley right here on the right, I can put more food into the storeroom to a maximum of 600 kilograms worth of food. So let's take this preserved pork. Uh, we'll throw it in here, transfer. And now if we look at our discipline, we now have plus eight as opposed to plus four. Because the chef has the ability to make more types of food. So that's great. We can raise up our discipline faster if it's been depleted through battle, so on and so forth. Okay? So you've got your lighting, you've got your food. You can also have your radioman right here, Mr. Osterman. Mr. Osterman, since I've selected him down here, and I could do this in first person mode as well, but since I've selected him down here, he has... You can see here he's lit up with a number two, just above the fact that he's working the radio. And we have two radio stations. You have Radio La Rochelle, Rise of the Valkyries, Flight of the Valkyries. Something about Valkyries, that's important. So he's playing that for the crew right now. And look, now we have a plus 10 to our di discipline because of music. So we shut that off. Very good. Um, so yes, come over to this table, right? I can have them play cards. So this fella, let's get Mr. Watcher here over to this table to play cards with the crew, all right? So he was, where was he? He was back here. Here he comes walking along. By the way, if you get lost, all you have to do is click uh, this little guy right here, this little icon, and it'll bring you to where he is, okay? So now he's sitting down, and he's having a game of cards with Comrade Otto here. And look at that. Playing cards is giving us a plus seven 
So there are some things you can do to keep discipline up. However, if you are at alarm, okay, if you're at alarm, you cannot affect your discipline. You can't add, you can add more food, but it will do nothing. Okay. You can, you can't, you don't even have the ability to play cards or turn on the radio or whatever, because you are at battle stations. So they're not going to allow you to sit around and play cards. But a lot of times in battle, uh, your morale is going to keep depleting farther and farther and farther down. And once it gets to a certain point that one of your crew members will be losing his mind, freaking out because he's stuck underwater, stuck at battle stations, he's, he's scared, is he might break. Okay, He could have a heart attack, which is not good because then you've got to get a medic onto him to prevent him from dying. Or he could start having a full-blown tantrum, go into absolute hysterics, he start, he's screaming and crying, and you're, you're hiding from warships. That is not good. So you would have to get one of your leaders, and we'll talk about the different types here in a minute, to go over and either calm him down or choke him out if he can't be calmed down, okay? That will give you a boost to your discipline again because that guy has now gone sleepy sleep or he's all calm and stuff and give you, say, another hour's worth of breathing room. But you definitely don't want people running around and screaming because you're going to alert um, your enemies to where you are if you're trying to hide underwater and be all sneaky sneaky. So that was your discipline. Let's talk about, to the right of that, you've got your reputation. A reputation is gained by completing missions, by sinking ships, so on and so forth, okay? Um, your reputation also comes along with reputation points. You can see we are, we are sitting at zero. We have no reputation points because we have not done any missions. The reputation points can be used for a variety of different things. On the one hand, you can ask for favors from command to give you certain special abilities, to allow you to research things faster or... Um, the ability to have more officers on board, so on and so forth, because you're stuck to the five right now. Um, you can also use uh, your points to promote ordinary ordinary sailors, okay? So like this fellow right here, Mr. Dirk Maz, we could actually promote him and make him an officer if we have an available slot for him to be promoted into using those reputation points. So that'll become very, very important later on. Budget. We have 6,000 budgets. Um, that's that's money. That's in-game money, okay? You start off with an extraordinarily small amount of money. Um, 6,000 might seem like a lot, but one single torpedo costs 800. We've got 14 torpedoes we can take aboard. So that budget is going to burn itself over really quickly. Plus, we need more food. We need fuel. We need ammunition. So in the beginning of the game, your budget is pretty constrained. It's, that's only a problem right now. Once I do one mission, two missions, I'm going to have more money than I know what to do with, and I'll never be able to spend it all. It's, it's impossible to spend all the money you get. It allows you to play with the game. It allows you to do all the things you can do and learn the game. So on the, on the one hand, it kind of sucks that it's not realistic. On the other hand, hey, it is what it is. It's a game. It's not ready. So to the right of that, we have some command uh, buttons. We've got our telegraph, and your telegraph is your speed, okay? So this is your engines. Um, this is diesel, okay? It says diesel in the mo diesel motor, diesel motor, okay? This is your diesel engine. Uh, a quick disclaimer, if you set this game to English at the beginning, uh, which I did not do, this will not be in English. It will still be in German, so uh, you're just going to have to learn what these things are, uh, unfortunately. You've got uh, your electric engines is over here, okay? This is your electric over on this side. We've got five gears to go forward. So from bottom to top is slowest to fastest, and the same for to the rear. So in diesel, if you uh, if you have all your officers where they need to be to give you the absolute best speed possible, and you go to fifth gear, absolute flank speed, let's go, 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 you're going to top out about between 17 and 19 um, knots, okay, uh, on a clear day. Uh, if the Cs are bad, you're going to see a lot less speed, and if you switch to electrics, you'll see even less speed than that, so... Very important to note that electric and uh, diesel are, are quite different uh, in the way they operate. Beside that, we've got our depth meter. This right here is a handy dandy little tool for diving your submarine or uh, or, or raising, sorry, submarine, for diving your, your U-boat or bringing it back to the surface. So you can see here we've got a gauge. Um, I can click anywhere in this gauge and it'll tell them to dive to where I click. So if I click that around here and this thing will slowly start trucking its way towards it, okay? Um, I could click anywhere, although I don't recommend getting too far into the red. 
I found that around 200, 210, I start developing leaks, uh, pipes start bursting, so on and so forth. So yeah, you can set the depth to whatever you want right here. Conversely, right here, you've got some quick and easy commands. So you've got surface the boat, you've got run decks awash. So nothing will be out of the water except for the conning tower, okay? And this is just to give you a little bit better sight at the surface without giving away your position entirely. You've got periscope depth, which is going to drop you down to around, oh, I think it's something to the tune of 15 meters, 14 meters. And that gives you enough room to play with your, um, your scopes to allow you to get a little height on them, six feet out of the water or so, so you can take a peek at the enemies. You've got maximum safe depth. So this is your, you, this is your crash dive, okay? You slam on this, and this is going to peg itself all the way down to 150. 150 is considered the max safe depth for your type, your type 7C. Um... I know it'll work pretty well at about 180, realistically, but there's something to, to bear in mind. If you have collision damage on, and you're sitting in 50 meters of water, and you slam crash dive, it's going to try to get to 150. So you are going to drive your boat into the bottom, okay? And then you're going to get damaged, and you're not going to be having a good time. So don't do that. Um, if you don't have collision damage on, you won't damage your submarine, but the noise of your submarine scraping along the bottom is going to be very, very, very uh, detrimental to hiding. So uh, your enemies are going to find you a lot faster. You can also uh, work all these stations from inside the boat, but I think I'm going to leave the at-sea stuff for, for the next tutorial. We're just going to be getting into the basics of the game here. Okay, what's next? Next is our rudder. So it's set at peg zero. Peg zero is dead ahead straight. No turns, no nothing. I can set it to whatever I want. I can set it to 20 degrees port. Um, it's going to stay there. So if we were out in open sea and I slam it on 20 degrees port, we're going to do a great big circle. We're just going to spin around and around on the map, and it won't ever go back to zero on its own. You actually have to bring it back to zero in order to straighten out your ship. Same with port. Um, so it's just important to note that this is useful for, say, bringing your boat back to dock. Uh, conversely, you can steer your boat by going outside like this and just holding the right-click button. And you can see here I could give it a 19 degrees port, 43, 55, whatever. Let's go back to zero. Bang. Okay. Um, to the right of that, we have the map key. Okay. So clicking this brings up our map. All right. Your star is your port. This is where we're at. Okay. So you can scroll all the way down. Um, it's just gorgeous. So you can scroll all the way in. You can scroll way out. Or you can scroll way the hell out for navigation purposes. This rudder tool is great for steering... Um, close up and personal if you just really need to make a little extra nudge or whatever but from the most part most of my steering is done here at the map and that's done by just simply right clicking where you want to go okay so if we were going to head out into the atlantic you do not want to just click to right click out here there you go it says we're going to go out there right no problem let's take a look uh, no, we're not, because it's going to spin the boat around and smash it into the dock, because our boat is dumb. It's not very smart. It does not understand that things are in the way, okay? So what you actually have to do to get out of port is you have to right-click somewhere out here. Okay, so your boat, if I was to turn the engines on, is going to go and follow this line. Now, we can make a chain of waypoints to pilot ourselves as a course out of the port. And the way we do that, don't just right-click again in this direction because it, it will completely change where you're heading. First right-click is the first waypoint. If you hold the shift key, it'll give you a second waypoint. Out there, and then there, and then there, and then there, and then out into the Atlantic. And if at any given time you click in here on the rudder, it will erase all the commands you just gave it. So we went into the map by clicking this button. We can just hit the M key to get out of the map, or into the map, or out of the map, M key, okay. So if we click the rudder again, it will make this go away. What else do we have here? So we got the menu. Menu is going to give you, you just mouse over it, don't click it, because then you do that thing where you're trying to click it, and it's not, it's just stop, just, just hover over it. Go down to journal. This is our activity. We have no activity. We've done nothing. Next up is management, and this gives you some control over the manning of your boat, all right? So you can see here we're at five of five officers, okay? We have our skipper, who is a leader type. We have Klaus Hagno, who is also a leader type. You can tell by this badge. Now, the skipper does have a little badge if I get out of this, like so, and you can see the little badge. So leader, leader. Then we've got engineer, engineer, and radioman, okay? Now, all of these things are important because only certain people can do certain jobs. 
So this guy or this guy can use anything that requires sight. So he can use the Uzo, the observation scope, the attack scope, the deck gun, the flak gun. They can also navigate. Navigation is going to be very, very important. I'll show you guys that in a later video uh, once we get to see. The engineers have only certain things they can do. They can operate the depth steers. Uh, when you're submerged, these depth steers really come in handy, and you'll get a full tutorial on that. They can operate the diesel engines. They can operate the electric engines. They can also do repairs and uh, build spare parts, all kinds of good stuff. And you'll see that further on down the line. Your radioman, they can use your radio and they can use your hydrophone, okay? Um, and again, I'm going to show you guys how to tweak your radioman so that he's much better at that tasking. Uh, so back to the management screen. What we can do here, you see we got five of five officers, so we're maxed out on officers. We don't want to take any away because all of these guys are going to be very, very useful. In fact, more officers is better. We only have 16 of 18 crew aboard. So let's go ahead and pick up Mr. Hans Fischer by clicking the check mark. And I already took a Hans, so let's get Horst Weber. Horst Weber. So now we're at a full complement of 18, 18 personnel and one captain. Okay? So we're completely maxed out on personnel. If I didn't want uh, Mr. Weber, I just uncheck him. And now he's off the boat. I can also click on it and bring up Mr. Weber. I can completely kit him out however I want. I can customize him. He has no skills to speak of. If I had some reputation points, I could promote him to either a leader, an engineer, or a, um, a radioman. Or I can disband him altogether and make him disappear from my lists. Because why would I disband him? Well, let's say we had that situation I talked about with discipline where it got down to zero and he lost his mind. So he shows himself to be a coward. And then forever, he's going to have a little um, blip right here under the question mark showing that he is a coward. I would take him off my boat and I would replace him with somebody else. Okay, so disbanding just cleans up your list so it doesn't go on infinitely over time. So that was management. Let's go to headquarters. Headquarters here. This is where you do research for future technologies. All right. So if we click here on the empty slot, it gives us a map view. And this map view is going to give you a whole bunch of different options. Okay. There's aerial surveillance that, being, that could be carried out. There's military stashes to raid and get extra budget out of. And there's things you can actually research, okay? Now, you need an officer to do research. You need an available officer to do research. So we could go back into the management screen, take an officer off our boat, and have him conduct research, all right? We're not going to do that, but for the purposes of just getting into the game, this is how it would work. Later on down the road, as we do some Let's Plays on it, and I show you guys a little more how to, how to get how to navigate the game um, in a playable fashion. I'll show you guys, once you pick up some spare officers, what you can do with them. So you can see here that these are your technology researches. We have three that are fully available, and we have six that are available, but they have warnings. And we're going to talk about that in a second. So we've got accumulators one, so this is making your batteries better. We've got improved toilets. And it seems funny, but if you're underwater, you can't flush the toilet. <laughs> okay. So the toilet's not going to work very well underwater, and that is going to be very, very detrimental to your discipline. Your discipline's going to go down really fast because the guys are stuck underwater and they can't poop. So yeah, you definitely want to improve your toilets. And we've got uh, equipment production level one, okay? And we'll get into that. Um, these ones with the warnings. Again, we're in 1941. We're in January of 1941. I believe the 11th we were at. Now, these represent technologies that did not exist on January 11th, 1941, okay? That's why they have the little yellow icon. So let's look at snorkels. If you have to wait until 7-5-1942 until this little icon goes away, the warning goes away, okay? Snorkels did not exist at this moment in time, at least in the game. I don't know about historically speaking. I don't know. I'm not a history buff. But, but in-game, snorkels did not yet exist. Um, 12 days, right? So it would take 12 days to research the snorkels. Or sorry, 24 days. If I was to put an engineer here and get him working on it, it would take over 40 days. Okay? Because depending on how far away that technology is from your current date and time in game, it takes longer and longer. All right? So for instance, this military stash one could be done in 8 days. This equipment could be done in 12 days. All right? So it says 24. It's not going to be 24. It's going to be, it's going to be longer than 24. I promise you. Okay? So yes, that is research in a nutshell. Once you have something researched and you have enough budget, you can upgrade your ship. And we'll be able to show you that later on as we move forward. So that was headquarters. 
Um, the U-Boat Topia currently does nothing. It is not built yet. I would, I would imagine it's going to work a lot like the Civipedia for any Civ fans out there. But right now, it's uh, it's dead. We've got our save. We've got our save. We've got our load. We've got settings. So unlike terrible, terrible games, um, you can change your settings on the fly. Okay, You can change your graphics on the fly. Everything on the fly, you don't have to restart the game. So thank you, Dev. Thank you, Playway, for uh, creating a game where I can change my... Uh, graphical settings on the fly it is fantastic perfect um and we've got exit so let's talk about the right side of your screen okay we've got a vessel detected we have detected a nearby vessel that sounds terrifying because we are in port okay and how do we know this we can talk to klaus over here klaus is up on the uzo right and he can see that we're in port good for him so that's he's saying the port is a target uh sure Okay, thanks. Thanks, guy. Um, this would be very, very handy if you were coming across a convoy with multiple targets. It'll show you how many and give you the ability to select them. And when you select them, it'll give you some information about them, okay? In this little handy-dandy drop-down, it'll give you, like right now, it's bare, it's 610 meters away, it's at 49 degrees, it's not moving because it's a port. I have a 100% torpedo solution on it. I could plot an intercept course to it, although it's not moving. I could look at it with the camera, and there it is. I could open the calculation station, and I could tell Klaus to start working on a torpedo um, calculating solution on it, or I can just bring up my torpedoes and fire at will. Okay, so that's what the targeting, uh, the detection hint is all about. Here you've got your ship's buoyancy. It's at 100%, so we're 100% floaty. If this was decreased due to water in our boat, we would float less well, and it would be much much harder to keep ourselves at the surface. Here we've got our visibility slash detection, so we are 92% visible, okay? We are very, very visible at this time. That's why it's in red. Um, our hull is 100% visible because it's a great big steel hull, obviously. And the cloudiness of the day is giving us a benefit of a minus 8 to our visibility. So it's making us a little bit harder to see, bringing our round total to 92%. This is important information when you're sneaking around because you need to know how visible you are. Everything about your boat is visible. If you are submerged and put your periscope up, that periscope is to a some degree visible, depending on time of day, sun's position, cloudiness, waves, all that good stuff, okay? Our noise, we are generating 88 decibels worth of noise. That's because our gyro compass is on. Our gyro compass is loud. It is making noise. We could turn that off to kill the noise, but the gyro compass comes in very, very handy when it comes to navigation, and we'll see that in a later video. So your engines will make noise, your gyroscopes make noise, your ventilators make noise, your electric steering makes noise, people in your boat make noise, dealing with torpedoes make noise. All of these things will get you caught, okay? So it's very important to keep an eye on how much noise you're outputting to know how much you can get away with. Radar signature, so this comes into play when you're dealing with aircraft, when you're dealing with warships. They have, a lot of the bigger warships, like destroyers, have radars, okay? Which means they can pick you up on radar even if they can't see you. So you definitely got to keep an eye on the radar signature. And there, there's upgrades you can get later on for uh, anti-radar coatings and so on and so forth. So that's just very important to know. Okay, so let's talk about our officers down here at the bottom. We can select each officer and then with an officer selected, you can engage with things in the boat. Or just tell them to move around sim style. And you do have to wait for them to actually walk over to the thing you want them to deal with, okay? So we're going to get into that when we get into C, about who's going to do what, and a little tips and tricks on who to use to do what. Not only that, but you can see that they have what they're doing. So he's working the diesel engines. You can give him helpers, right? So now Mr. Alwyn Peters and Mr. Stephen Mayer are helping him out with the engines. And that becomes important later on, because if we were trucking along at sea, going flank speed... Having helpers on your engines is actually going to decrease your fuel consumption. So for now, let's just take his helpers away. Um, you, we can see that he has four hit points, okay? Uh, he has not been hurt in any way. Four is the maximum that a person can have in this game, unless I put a helmet on him, okay? In the forward of the ship, you have a storage room right here. You can open that up, and you can put a helmet on him. So he's going to head off to grab his helmet. You can see he's walking towards the storage. So, boom, he's got his helmet, and suddenly he has six hit points. Now, that's very important. I once had my chief um, my uh, chief boats, uh, bosun on the deck gun, and he had a helmet on. 
The deck gun took a direct round. It killed one of my guys, one of my uh, ordinary sailors. It uh, killed my deck gun. My deck gun was damaged. It needed to be re repaired. But my bosun lived. His helmet disappeared, and he got knocked down to, uh, I think, three hit points at that time as six, but he lived. So the helmet does indeed come in handy. So also talking about what you can do with your officers down here, what else can this little menu tell us? It tells us he's our chief engineer, but we could also give him a different job, okay? And we could do that right here, or we could go directly into his customization screen and look at his job. Now, as the chief engineer, his primary task is the engines. It's the first thing he's going to do. Engines first, repairs later. That's his deal. So if you leave him to his own devices, he's going to go to sleep, get up, and work the engines. Go to sleep, get up, and work the engines. That's what he does, okay? I could make him a mechanic, and as a mechanic, he would be more concerned with the torpedoes, okay? He can still work the engine, but he would be more concerned about torpedoes, making spare parts, and doing repairs. We could make him the quartermaster, which is kind of useless so far in this build. This is to make sure that there's always ammo by the deck gun, there's always food in the galley, so on and so forth. I really don't see any use for this just yet now because I tend to be a little more hands-on. He could be a medic, so he'd carry around a first aid kit and help people out. Or he could be our gunner, and his job would be using the gun. So let's get out of that. Um, we could send him to bed, and off he goes. Now, it's not necessary that he's going to sleep, but he'll rest. So you can see here, on his picture, he's about halfway down this blue bar. Half the bar is gray and half is blue. The blue is his, let's say, life force or something. The, basically, this is your character's fatigue, okay? When it gets depleted all the way down to yellow, which starts about, let's say, here. When it gets down to the yellow, they become less useful, and they're down to the yellow. Um, what else can we learn about our sailor down this way? This is your experience bar. He has no experience right now. You get experience through things like calculating torpedo solutions, like... Um, fixing things like decoding enemy transmissions, like uh, healing a sick member or an injured member. Yeah, that kind of stuff. You get experience for little jobs here and there, and you'll also get experience overall just from the patrol you were on. Okay, so that gives us the basics of the screen that we're looking at. That's everything that I can think to talk about here. If I miss something, please let me know in the comments down below. And in the next uh, tutorial, we're going to show you guys how to outfit your boat with kit. Get some gear on board, get hooked up with torpedoes, food, little tips and tricks about where to store stuff. Feel free to hit a like, and if you want to continue on with the series with me on the U-Boat tutorial stuff, and then some Let's Plays in the future, go ahead and hit that subscribe button. I've been Lightly Salted. Thanks for tuning in. Bye now.